We welcome you to Conversations and Coffee today on this 28th day of October, 2021. The day for many of trick or treat throughout the city. In Ireland, one of the places where the tradition began used to say, help the Halloween party, give some soul cake, a party prefacing the Feast of All Souls and All Saints. I'm Ellen O'Shaughnessy from that Irish lineage and coordinator of the Conversations and Coffee program. We're here virtually by Zoom, brought to us by virtue of Lindsay Lasanti, graduate of Otterbein University, linking us together from the Cultural Arts Center. We have a great faculty, great staff, with director Jeffrey Martin's leadership, bringing the arts to the city. Today we have with us our guest artist, Eric Scott Murphy, who tells me he loves to paint and draw. Wood carving and making found art sculptures are also a passion on, for him. After studies at Columbus College of Art and Design, he served 16 years in the Air Force Reserves as a graphic illustrator. Eric enjoyed several solo exhibitions at Studio for Art in Nelsonville, Ohio, and Logan Art Gallery in Logan, Ohio. Eric spends his time between his home studio in Westerville and Studio 103 at 400 West Rich Street. He continues to search for that expressive voice and clear artistic expression and vision. While Eric didn't grow up in an artistic family, he said he was encouraged to create from an early age. He recalls getting a John Nagy learn to draw kit at age five and his third grade teachers allowed him to stay in the classroom and draw birds during recess. How wonderful. Gradually, Eric progressed from drawing animals to human figures and faces, embracing art as a means of exploring both himself and his surroundings. His studio, 400 Rich Street, is packed with these accumulated explorations from invented comic book characters and portraits of politicians to an expressive, lovingly rendered oil painting of his father. Eric wants to share with us today people who are positive influences in his career. A.J. Venderelli, Betty Stoll, Stephanie McGlone, current art instructor Brent Payne and classmates, and Tom Belliol. Eric has titled his Conversations and Coffee today from Avengers to Jim Crow. His love of comic book art and adventure led him to collect Marvel's Avengers back in the 60s. Eric is going to share some pages of his own graphic novel. His exhibit, Jim Crow Must Go, was shown in February for Black History Month at 400 West Rich Street. There's so many subjects to speak on, Eric shares. That's why there's a little sign outside my door that says he's still searching for that expressive voice. We are delighted, Eric, that you are with us today expressing your creative voice for sure. So take it away. I am gratified to be here, Ellen. Thank you, Ellen. Lindsay, for your assistance. And I do want to say about the third grade teacher, first of all, Mrs. Maurer, and oh. she had a little thing she wanted to do with birds, and I volunteered, not knowing <laughs> I had to give up recess for the whole week, because she had me in there, instead of playing with the kids, I'm in there drawing. Oh. And my third day, I'm wondering, why did I volunteer for this? I could draw at home, I could have my recess. It's just, it just weird how it worked out, you know, I had to sacrifice even back then, but but it's okay. It, it, it worked out well. Um, she got what she wanted, and I learned not to volunteer. <laughs> <sighs> oh, well, tell us. 
about your art and your life in art, beginning with the story of those birds. <laughs> well, that was a good beginning because I was drawing even before that, but I hadn't had the courage to really do a lot with other individuals. So my teacher let me do that, and I did get some confidence. That was fourth grade. No, this is my was third grade. By sixth grade, I was trying to do human figures, faces mostly, and no one was doing faces in sixth grade, only 10 years old, 11 years old. Actually, yeah, 10 or 11. Uh, a friend of mine, David Engelman, we lived across the alley from each other on the base, on the Air Force Base where I grew up. And uh, we're sitting in class, and I said, I want to be your partner, and, and I want to draw you. And so he sat there and I drew a, a rendition of him that wasn't too bad. And that was the first year that we had art and a teacher came from the high school to our elementary school class and gave mm. you know, official art lessons, Mr. Price, who I went under his wing at that time. By the time I was a freshman, I had my next four years of art in high school through him. Mm -hmm. or he had a relationship kind of established it was kind of fun because he wasn't he was a guy that was very i look back and call him corny because his jokes were very just very regular like regular americana but very conservative jokes very just everyday stuff and it'd be the obvious thing if he made a joke you, you could have you could have said the joke before he even spoke it because you knew what was coming <laughs> but he was a good guy, and he and he always guided me gently through new phases of learning art. It was just very, very cool. And um, by the time I got through high school, I mean, he gave me a one-man show my senior year, and I believe it was the first one, the first one-man show that our high school had ever done. Um, mm. Before that, freshman year, I have a memory of freshman year in his art class. We did some color cutouts, and I did a color cutout from a picture, a photograph that was taken of me leaning on a guitar. And I did a cutout of just like part of my face was orange, another part was red, and it was a good, it was a good depiction, but it was almost in a like a fauvistic or like loud color impressionistic type thing cutouts on black paper background. And he picked it to, to show, and there was a, you know, some like bulletin board type things put in the hallway. And one of my, that piece was, was my representation. And there were several people, you know, like seniors were being shown, juniors, you know, my one freshman. And lo and behold, one day I go in there, it's been up for a few days. I go in the, the school in the lobby part where it was, and mine was gone. Ooh. And I was like, Do anybody, you know, I went to my teacher and told him, I said, I'm surprised my, my piece is gone. And all we could figure is it was stolen. I went home and told my dad, because I was really upset. My, my paper piece was that I liked was stolen. Sure. He says, son, take that as a as a extreme compliment. They liked it well enough to steal it. Oh. I thought that was a well that was well done and he presented it like that to me and framed it that way. And so oh. that was well, fresh. That's, yeah, let's see the the work that you're doing now. We're excited about it. That was yeah. And you and Lindsay are going to be uh Sharing the images, yes, okay. wonderful. Yeah. That's a this painting is oh. it's in my studio, and I apologize, I apologize for the background. It's it's you know it's it's there. I love being into people's studios. It's really interesting to me. Yeah, well, yeah. It, it just it was a painting that was inspired by a comment my I'm, my brother made to me. You know, we're we're pretty close. I got two brothers younger. I'm the oldest of four siblings, so he was saying that you know we always have jesus depicted as a you know european caucasian or whatever and i said yeah I, I think i'd like to do a painting of a more palestinian looking christ i'm not saying black african i'm saying just more like even if he was a jew who was white if you want to say that walking in the sun's ministry he would have gotten some color to his skin he would have tanned a little bit so Anyway, I, I thought I'd do a Palestinian representation with the other one in the background with a paintbrush showing that he was created by, you know, 
Europeans, not by Palestinians or Jews, but and then Mount Moriah is is behind the Palestinian um, figure, and then of course we have the the nice depiction of uh, the atomic bomb on the left, you know, by the the created Christ. So, wow. yeah, that's kind of the theme of that. Just kind of a loose rendering of a of a different version than we usually see depicted in this country mm. and in Europe. Really. Beautiful, beautiful. Thanks. Uh, these two figures, these paintings were probably completed in the last year, but the uh, design work for this I did in high school, I'm sitting there doodling, and I come up with this world, and I put a face inside, and then I put the eagle on it and try to put some, you know, some Americana in it with the flag and the stripes. And I had it as a pencil sketch for a long time. And then a few, a few years later, when I was in the Air Force Reserve, we needed a, um, we needed an invitation for a Black History Month. And I made it using this design. So it worked out well. It was used, I, I made a female face in a, in a male face and had a double image on the invitation. Mm. These paintings are more, I call them pro-Americanism or African-Americanism because they, um, they just kind of represent some things to me about America and my place in America. And I'm as patriotic as the next person. And I, I think that represents me or any other person of color in there. Um, it's obvious that a person of non-color could be in there because this, that's what America's about. When you see anything in the ads for I want you, it's usually, you know, Uncle Sam, he's white and so forth. But I felt like we needed some representation for the, the people uh, who weren't represented. So that's why that was there. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Unifying. I did a series of probably seven or so of those. Mm. Three of them in a restaurant called Adela's right now over on Oak and Miller. And um, the rest are in my studio, making it hard to walk through sometimes with my art that I've, you know, accumulated. But this one's recent. This is called Two Eagles. And that's shortened from Chief, Two Eagles. I had some various narratives I was trying to to accomplish with with just the two the images of the two faces the one face is the actual chief leading his people and you can see the people on his arm going across the bottom and he's pointing towards a place that we don't know where they're going but he's leading them the, um, his name would be actually two eagles but the second face is kind of an astral or spiritual representation of him as a leader just trying to get his people where they need to go and um that was, that was a fun one to do. It just, it, it, I, I think I need to do about three more paintings like that about the character that I kind of created because a painting to me is a static, uh, just a static statement. And it, it could always, you know, you can always investigate it further. The images, and if, they, if they're working for you, you feel good about them, you feel like you should go further. And I, I feel like this one could have been more. And I love Native, the Native American culture. I love anyway, so... I'll be revisiting this at some point, but that for the time that was okay. That 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 worked for me. This one has so much action in it. It really feels like it's moving. It's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this, yes. Yeah. I I find myself wanting to say several things, but one thing I want to mention is when I was a kid in California, my best friend was a, a Hispanic dude named. Um, Guy Fernando Espinoza and the Indian friend of mine, who he looked just like like you two, like just fair skinned, but he had freckles. His name was Johnny Bat, and he was Native American. And uh, those were my best buddies. I have pictures of me having my arms around them guys, and they were shorter than me. I was a tall one. But I think I always find myself going back to indigenous people of some continent either where i what i experienced or australia you know aborigines or something to find out more about them because i feel like 
that's the root of our of our existence on this world is you know adam wasn't this white guy with blonde hair adam was a, a guy from the earth whatever where he was created and that was his you know that was his where he was derived from so his color may not have been like we typically depict in european histories white yes mm -hmm. striking this one is close to my heart it's called celestial servant and i've done two versions of this one um this is the original which is smaller it's probably i don't know 18 by 24 or smaller than that i've got a larger version i think you may have a slide of uh, but this is the best one. I did this one when I was living in Logan and the gallery owner at Studio for Art, her name was Gayla, beautiful lady. She liked this and she said, you ought to make it bigger. I think the face should be bigger. So I did a larger one and mm. I put a crown on the head and you know the, the angel's wing on the back, which is supposed to be like a star or a galaxy or whatever nebula. I did that a little differently, more color. But I always like this one because of the simplicity and because it does, it, it captures the uh, the face the way I wanted to. Mm. It's all about just trying to get outside of our ideas of what what angels really are, who angels are. You know, we have the the versions of a human being being a messenger to be an angel, but then there's also those celestial beings that are out there, and we call it wings, but you know they're not going to have feathery bird wings, or they may have something to do with flight, the wings they have, but I, I just, uh, I like to try to try to get outside the box a little bit on our, our thinking spiritually, so. Well, that is one beautiful expression of wings. Thank you. Gorgeous, and the face is profound. I went to the wings first, and then the wings took me to the expression on the face. Gorgeous. Thanks. I can't believe that wasn't stolen. <laughs> well, some of the things that I'm doing now, I think they may be borrowed. I, you know, I, if, if yeah. they're valuable, they need to borrow other artists. I, I think I've used some people's images of things to, and, and tried to mold them into something that helped me express what I was trying to say. Mm. So I don't, yeah, I don't put it past anybody. I don't, I don't, I don't have copyrights on any of this stuff. Oh, careful. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. But the, the good thing is, is that the idea is there. And I think the idea is more important than me making money off of an image. Really, I, I'm, I'm not starving. I got to look over my head. I know I've saved bills. Mm -hmm. I never want to be rich, to be honest. I never want to have so much money that I have to look around to see if someone's chasing me to get what I have. And I, I never want to be held in judgment for what I didn't help somebody get and have. You know, that's not, that's not a cool thing either, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the guy that got me here. My dad was 19 when I, I got a picture in one of those sepia print pictures. And um, I thought I got to do something with this because I had, I've done sketches of my dad when I was 15, 16 years old and a little older and off of photographs. But this was such a good picture of him. The lighting was, the light was good. And um, I thought I got to do this. And so, it was very fun because it was my first venture in the oils. I've been using pastels, acrylics, watercolors, a lot of different media, pencil, pen and ink. But I wanted to try oil and I wanted to try a detailed painting to see how real I could get with it. And mm. I used a canvas that I had to paint over because it was an image I didn't like. And so I, I had some texture already on the canvas, which you can see on the, on the right side of the canvas, here's some, you can see some, some texture where the light hits it and it's, yeah, you can yeah. see that. So yeah. it, it made a challenge for me. I still wanted to be realistic, but I also wanted to leave that, that you know, that surface mm -hmm. to kind of remind me that, you know, as real as it's going to get, there's still going to be some, you know, something that says it's not a photograph, you know, it's always going to be a painting. And oh. uh, so mm -hmm. that's, Charles Murphy Jr., an image of him, that is. Oh. At 19, about the same age, he was creating me. <laughs> he was 19 years old than I, than I. He passed away back in 91. Beautiful. But he was a, uh, 
career Air Force guy, you know. He was an aircraft mechanic, worked on B-52s and the KC-135 Stratotanker. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am who I am today, largely because of him. His influence, even after I got grown, he still had a hand in some decisions I was making. So, mm -hmm. yeah. That's magnificent. That well? Say it again. Yes, magnificent. And the drawing and the color, mm. expressive, as you have said you want to be. Yes, I tried to get some lavenders and purples in there because I love purple as a color and mm -hmm. worked in a little bit. Mm. Yeah, I think about a lot of things I could say about dad, but I, I, I really feel like I'm the oldest of four. My next oldest brother is Charles Murphy the third. And uh, because mom named me, and then he got the next choice, so he named his next son after himself. And then mom got to name my brother Steve. And then my dad finally had a girl, so he named her Velma Jr. Oh. A rare thing at that time, I think. And so we still call her Junior sometimes, June Bug. I mean, we, we have our nicknames for our baby sister, but she's like 50 years old now, I think. So <laughs> still a baby, though. Still a baby girl. <laughs> Yeah, there's, yeah, we'll, we'll thank you for moving on with that because this one takes us right into the depth of, of current status of American, I don't know, defense. This is called weapons of mass destruction. Oh. And the skull in the middle is a, an actual animal skull. I'm not sure if it's raccoon or possum, but but that skull, one of the jaws was a little bit loose, so I cracked it open, and I thought, that's interesting. Cracked the other one open and, and sat it there for a while, and I thought, that looks like an ant in a way, you know, the, the jaws of an ant. So and the more I thought about it, I thought, well, I'll attach those. And I, I glued them together, painted it up. I used the piece of paper behind it as the house plans for a round house that we constructed in Logan, Ohio, my wife and I and our neighbors. Oh. But it looked kind of technical, so I used that. And then the board, electronics from, I think, a TV. And then I thought, well, that looks like it could be something that would, would be almost something that exists, but what is it? And that's what I thought the weapons of mass destruction were that were supposed to be hidden in Iraq or I mean, I know, there was something that they could exist. I, I'll probably never see them. And has anyone really seen them? And I don't know. But I but the power that that comes from this kind of, of, of you know man-made object is the top of the uh, the top of the piece. It's the atomic bomb exploding and and um, I thought this was a message to like, we need to be a little more scrutinizing of, of the things that we think exist. And then, and then if they do exist, look at the power we're wielding and look at, you know, the cautionary tales we could take from what, what we've done to the earth and to other people with that power. Mm. That was one of my earlier ventures into assemblage because I've been painting flat up until this time, but I started putting things together and, and trying to make them into more sculptural pieces, more three-dimensional. This is still two-dimensional, but it's got some depth to it. If you can see the box that that, mm -hmm. that that skull is housed by, that box is at least an inch and a half deep and it's got glass over it. And, um, mm -hmm. and it's pretty simple, really. It's all done on blackboard with white paint. And then the other things, you know, painting a, a frame gold and trying to use a kind of a gold paint for the, the skull. But I always liked that piece. I always thought it said something that makes you question, you know, what is it, first of all? What is it? And then when you find out what it is, do you really believe that it was really there, you know? Hmm. This painting is called a little liberty and 
I thought it worked on several levels because I saw a magazine picture of a, a, of a black lady with a baby at her breast and she was very impoverished. You could see that and she was very distressed with her expression. And I thought this is, this is an emotional picture, but it also represents who we should be as America helping this very people that are like this. Color didn't really matter to me as much as the, the quality of the photograph. The, the photographer got such a good vivid image. And so I used that as the face for Lady Liberty. And um, some things I did purposely and some things I did accidentally. I mean, there's no light showing for the light of freedom or whatever you want to call that symbol that we have in our hand. No books for the laws that, that she holds with her left arm. Mm. But I thought, regardless of what's going on, I'm going to show some stripes from the flag, you know, the, the blood and the purity and the things that that's supposed to symbolize. Also realizing that we're not getting it this generation. <laughs> Each generation hopefully will improve on that, that thing that Jefferson and, and Washington and all those guys started off. And the little liberty is really the, the red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight, is, is what's going on on the bottom across the, uh, the body of Lady Liberty is, is these children that are liberties in themselves holding up the torches. Um, and I, I would hope that we could see some improvement, some, you know, some, uh, some progress towards what America should have been in the first place. It never has actually attained. Mm. Yeah. That was my idea what a little liberty would be. Yeah. That a little child shall lead us, huh? Definitely. Yes. Always. Mm -hmm. The drawing is amazing. Well, thank you. Oh, yes. The color is beautiful. The drawing and the expression on the face. Do you spend time yes. doing that? Oh. That was the photo reference. That was mostly that photographer, but... Uh -huh. It was a black and white picture, and she was clearly a black woman. But by the time I got through with it, making it, you know, the green and the patina or whatever from yes. the statue, I thought, well, that still represents, you know, what I wanted to do. And the manager at 400, the uh, maintenance manager, looked at it and says, Eric, why'd you put James Baldwin's face on the Statue of Liberty? I said, man, that's not James Baldwin, but that's okay. It doesn't matter who it is. You get you get the picture that that's, that person's not really happy with the way things are going. And that's what I wanted to get, get through is that if Lady Liberty had an expression, because that Greek goddess look she has, perfect features, doesn't show any emotion at all. But if she had an expression, I would think she's not too happy with the way we're trying to represent freedom. Mm. Not really. Mm. Mm -hmm. These two, one is an assemblage, which I, I'm doing more and more, just found objects. Just, you know, you have, you have pieces of, of <laughs> things you find and put together and it, hopefully you create something that is worth looking at. I won't say a thing of beauty because that's always going to be, you know, a judgment call by whoever's looking at it, but, but that one got accepted for a show in Wilberforce, Ohio, um, called The Soul of Art. And it's on display there now until, I think, February. Uh, that was a fun one to do because the face I did is a clay face that I, you know, modeled and then fired and then put like a metallic glaze on it. And I didn't know what I was gonna do with it because it actually was supposed to be, uh, it was supposed to be a model of Lincoln, trying to get, get Lincoln, Lincoln's features down because I was doing a wood carving at the time and Lincoln was one of the figures. So I wanted to do a clay model to get something about the right size to use as a reference for my wood carving. 
And the wood carving is still in process. It's been 10 years in process. So it's kind of a funny story. But, but this clay piece allowed me to at least have some finality or some completion to a piece that, that I was working on. And I really was pleased with this. And I even added more. You've got a version here that was completed while I was in Logan, brought it up here to Columbus, and I thought it was done. And I started working on it for this show, Soul of Art. And I thought, oh, I can put more on this. And I put more on it. And pretty soon, it, it morphed into something else. Mm -hmm. Still you, recognizable. Still, still, you could see what it was, but uh, a little bit different. And then the, the picture next to it is my portrait of A.J. Vanderelli on a day where I don't think she wanted a picture taken. She looks very stern. That's not usually how I see her. She's usually pretty happy-go-lucky. She's an artist. She's a gallery um, facilitator, uh, a great person to encourage you about your art. And uh, she didn't ask me to do a portrait. I just decided that she was a person I really, I really felt like I wanted to, to work with with her features because I, she inspires me. So, so I took the photos and walked away feeling like I, I did good to not get scolded for slowing her down and saying, please pose for me, you know, but, but she was a good support about it. And I gave her the, the, the final painting it's hanging in her gallery, oh. but that's acrylic paint. That's, uh, that's what I'm working with mostly now. So that, uh, yeah, that was, that was my thoughts on AJ. I cut out a little piece of a, a voter voter literature was sent out, something about, um, what does that say? Official party business. Yeah. So I think it was something to do with the Democratic Party and they wanted you to, you know, fill something out for them. So I cut that out and I thought, that'd be good because the expression she has is official. It's not, it's about business. It's not about partying, even though she has a good time most of the time, but I thought that's a good way to put it, put it, you know, on her portrait, official wow. party business. And you have mentioned she is one of your mentors, your influence. Definitely. And what, and what is it particularly that she gave you as mentoring you? She gave me something I may have already had, but she brought to the forefront the idea that, you know, we're standing in a her studio, models are posing, and we're we're several of us, several of us are painting, and uh, I said I like the way you do that, AJ. I, and I was giving her all these accolades and phrases and, she, and phrases, and she said, "You do you, and I'll do me." And I thought, oh, she showed me respect for the respect she has for my stuff, and I'm always showing her respect to have for hers. So basically, we're on the same level, and I always kind of put her a little above me because she's got her degree from CCAD, and she's painted a long time. And the things that that I attribute to others, I have to realize some of that comes back to me. And I mm. I really respect her for saying that, and she's always been that way with me. Is, you know, we're, we're equal. She's I probably got her about 20 years, age-wise, but... Um, but she's smart and she's aware and she's very people oriented, very plugged into, you know, the happenings, the protests. She supported protesters here in Columbus, you know, put water and, and packages together to make sure they didn't like fall out from exhaustion during that time in the summertime a while back. Um, and she's always been courageous in that way with, with various peoples, just lifestyles. She's always been someone to stand up for you to say, hey, you know, you're as good as I am, you know, I'm no better than you. And that's what I got from her, I think, is just to have the courage to display the talent you have, what, what God has given you, get out there and stretch your stuff. Mm, great. This is a an older piece, which I think I've named a couple times, but it's Coins in a Fountain is the simple name for that. And Abraham Martin John is a theme I, I like to revisit from time to time. And this is a canvas that I retrieved from a guy, from a, a friend of mine, who moved into a house 
he had several, several canvases there in his house. And this was one from somebody who had a class with Mr. Drummond at CCAD. Mr. Drummond taught, I think, anatomy and drawing, some other things. But he even had his name, Craig Dickerson, 71 and 72. And I'm thinking, that is so cool, because I was there in 74, no, mm -hmm. 73. So Craig Dickerson's canvas is there in front of me, and it's got a painting on it I didn't care about. I thought, I'm going to gesso over this painting, because my friend gave it to me, and put what I want on there. I'm, you know, So that worked out well. And Mr. Lincoln has a, a coin he's on, as well as, you know, bill denomination. And Mr. Kennedy has a coin. And I thought, well, the song, Abraham, Martin, and John, lends some credibility to Martin Luther King, but he has no coin because he wasn't a president. How about that? I like that. Okay. So let me put it together and get an arrangement that I like. And I had an arrowhead that I, a friend of mine gave me. And it's a real Indian arrowhead, which seems out of place in the painting. But the more I did this, the more I realized, oh, I can use some, some current things in my life, like the word nirvana is on the right-hand part of the canvas, going vertical. Underneath that is a collage piece of a, a Logan map. It says South of Logan, if you look real close. So I loved being a Logan, and it, it kind of, nirvana was like where I am right now. God present with me, that, that was Nirvana. So that's why I put that on there. And then King having water coming out of his head or whatever this thing is coming on, it's just the idea that, you know, each man had his vision of what America should be. And, and you know, Lincoln had his, you know, free to slaves, whatever, whatever political constraints he was under to do that, that's fine. Kennedy did his thing with civil rights and, and he had his thoughts and, and, and admire him for that and admire all of them. But, but King, not being a president, not wielding the power, not wielding the power of the presidency to do what he did for the people, with the people, just warranted that distinction in the, uh, in the painting. You know, the, the black and white, the, uh, just the get, trying to capture his expression and make it as real as I could amongst these other dignities, just dignitaries, I should say. I, I like doing that one. I like that one a lot. And he gave his life for becoming a beloved community. Hmm? I love that as he expressed it, his ultimate goal to become a beloved community yes, yes. Mm. we need more visionaries that that realize we strive towards that we may never attain it but we always strive towards it like we like we can mm. here's the larger version of a uh, celestial servant and this when i think when i look at this and realize what the other one was this doesn't do it for me. I, I, I like some of the things I accomplished with this one. And there, it's hanging in an office at 400. Some, I don't even know which office it's in, but somebody has it on the wall. So there's merit to the piece. I, I just wish I could do it better. I'll have to do it again and I'll have to maybe do it bigger. But I've been doing some space scapes the last few months and I've gotten better at depicting the nebula and the, 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 the you know, the gases and, and so forth are in the space and the beauty of that. And I think I could do this justice now if I did it again. So. What would you do? Because it looks so, oh, so expressive now. It is. Well, that's the thing. I think I would like to see maybe a different angle, maybe, and maybe a little different motion, but more mood to it, more, this seems bright and it seems, the, the the wing is so overpowering, and I liked it at the time because it gave me room to put colors and, and investigate how to make a nebula cloud look, you know, mm. like a real cloud on a canvas with paint. But now I think I can do some more with the messaging with, you know, 
if we really look at what angels, what, what stars are, okay, if I, if I get into that, it, it, it takes me to a different level of, of trying to depict a celestial being because stars are beings of light, if you can say a star's alive. And knowing that, we only see a small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. We can even see what's going on out there. So there's a lot of ways to go with this, Alan. I could, you know, and, and getting away from male or female is a hard thing because we only understand life in certain terms. And when we really get into it, there's a lot to be done with images um, of we would call extraterrestrials or aliens. Well, they are aliens. The sun's an alien to us. I mean, but but there's just so much to to be able to to say about someone living in outer space for millions of years mm-hmm. fighting the battle of light over dark which is what stars do okay and and it just opens the door for a lot of communication for me i i, I don't i don't want to limit myself on that i even talking about it right now feels like i'm limiting myself <laughs> well i say the crown is magnificent what you've done in the the coloring of the that coming forth then brings oh that strong face the crown color just takes you to the expressive face it's magnificent i'm trying thank you for saying that i'm trying Takes us back down to earth. <laughs> it's called woman's world. Ah. And it's mostly my tribute to women. I love doing I love doing art depicting the human figure. And high on my list is nude women. So the male figure, I was doing that as a kid doing superhero drawings of Superman and Spider-Man and all those characters, right? The muscles. Yeah. That's always what, what I think most artists want to start off when they, when they learn human anatomy is, is the male figure. But at some point you realize, well, wow, Eve had it going on. She really knew, you know, I mean, God knew what he was doing. He pulled that part of Adam out and started forming this other figure. That, that, that's great. And so I always have a, an affinity if I can go back to something pure and something that I can catch light and shadow on is the, is, is the human figure, especially the woman. So the one figure, I did a smaller painting of the main figure in this, that pose, just almost like a, almost like a female crucifix, arms out, just kind of there with no visible means of, no visible means of support there, just you know, dangling in the air, floating. And I liked it, but it was on a small, probably six inches by six inch canvas. So this this canvas that I did this on is more like, I want to say four foot by four foot, 48 inches by 48 inches. And I could really spread the brush strokes out, play with color, play with surface, and really figure out what I wanted to kind of do with the figure. Um, so the upper figure is kind of jumping off or kind of floating down mm-hmm. in the center upper area of the canvas. And you've got women all over the place in this. And I just wanted to get as many bodies as I could in the canvas and still feel like it was a good composition. Mm-hmm. So even if you look, almost every place you look is a woman hidden anyway. The lower center of the canvas, uh-huh. You see a face, mm-hmm. yeah, and then there's a yeah, yeah. Okay, so right in there, yeah, the face, but then there's a woman in there too. If you look, yeah, you can see the woman. So it's I was trying to hide, yeah, you can see the the figure on the face. Mm. So I I call that successful in my book because I was able to do figures that seem believable. Mm-hmm. And put them in a fantasy atmosphere and have some color that I, I think makes you feel like, okay, that, that probably exists somewhere. You know, <laughs> it just it's so good to do that. How do you produce 
create that translucent look. What, what colors are you using? It's almost like you can see right through it. Well, I, I, what you're talking about, I think, is the, the blues and the, uh, the whites. And I think it's just the way you use it, like you're looking at a, a drop of water and how an artist will put uh, some blue down and put a dot of white on it to make it feel like it's, it's really water with some shape to it. That, mm. yeah, that, thank you for asking, Ellen, because that's a good question. I think some of the things that I do, I do instinctively sometimes without really knowing mm -hmm. my destination. And, and with this, I don't know that I was trying to create a watery substance or a translucent globe, you know, what I was really trying to form, except I like the shape on the canvas. Yeah. And I wanted it to feel like you could go in and, and it had some, you know, some depth to it. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Beautiful. Well, thank you. That's, you know, that's kind of a, it's kind of a mystery piece. I, I like saying it's woman's world and I like people to look at it and tell me what they think. I, I really, <laughs> I just had fun, <laughs> to be honest. Oh, yeah, it calls me to dance. <laughs> good, good. Yeah. You don't have much space where you have to dance right now, though, so. <laughs> dance in your heart, right? Dance in your heart. <laughs> <laughs> this is a uh, hallway of a church on Henderson Road. I work with the lady at Express Scripts who belong to this church, and she said they display artist pieces occasionally and wanted to know if I was interested. And I said, well, I'll come up and look. And I saw the space and I said, you know, I think I have enough pieces to, to put on a, a display there in an exhibit. And so I grabbed quite a few pieces. This is all starting on the right. This is um, Frederick Douglass. And I know Frederick Douglass had many, many pictures taken of himself when he was alive. Mm. But I thought I'm not going to use a canned picture of Frederick Douglass. So I got the mirror out and I got the light out and in a darkened room and I used my face to get the lighting right and I used some photos of him to put the features on it. And so I thought, I, now I have an original Frederick Douglass because, you know, I made it up. And uh, I, put, I actually went and got that framed after I did it and, and was pleased because I spent money on a frame for the first time in a long time. And the Masonite I did that on was was a picture my wife had done when she was probably 13 years old. She did an acrylic painting and she never liked it. And her mom treasured it and thought it was great, but you know, my wife didn't like it. So I said, well, I'll take the, the Masonite and I'll just it over it and started this Frederick Douglass picture, which you see there. I like the picture, but I think my grandkids, our grandkids would have liked to see their grandmother's picture. I don't know, maybe they will. So I kept the other one she did I didn't paint over it, so we still have that one. She did when she was like 11 years old. Oh. So that's the Frederick Douglass piece, and and the next one over is my cousin Charlie. Oh, he uh, he's a year older than me, but one summer when I was 15 years old, he came and stayed with us. And worked at the officers' club while I worked at the NCO club. Officers and NCOs, NCOs and non-commissioned officers. So the guys with stripes in their arms. Uh, went to the NCO club and then the officers with the medal on their shoulders they were the officers that he worked at their club I think he washed dishes I washed dishes at the other club and we got together and played basketball and ran around had good times that summer so now 45 50 years later he sends me a picture of himself with white hair because back then he had all black hair obviously we're teenagers and he had this huge mane and I, it was so striking but I thought, I've got to do a portrait of this guy. I mean, this is my, my cousin from, you know, way back when. So I did that one, and he liked it. I, I still have a portrait, but I sent him a picture of it, and he liked it. And uh, that, was, that was a good growth project for me because a lot of emotion goes into pictures. Some, you know, sometimes when you're, you're painting and you're drawing a subject and you're thinking all kinds of thoughts that may be even away from that, 
thing you're working on. But this, I had a good time with because it was it just took me out memory lane. I mean, all the things that we did when we were kids together and, and so forth. And then seeing this guy with this gray hair, white hair, actually, it was just such a, a cool thing to, to look at that and remember back and uh, try a few things. You know, I glued some aluminum foil to the canvas and painted around it and and uh, the upper the upper right of his head's got a little circle part. The upper right of his hair that's loom foil glued on right yeah upright and it almost reminded me of like you see a photograph sometime and you'll see a little light spot on it or something from either developing or maybe there was a, a shine of something on the lens of the camera but i i thought i'm going to put a gimmick like that in there because it was so cool with all the hair it was just the, the texture of the hair i just got into that and then i wanted something to kind of offset that i think just to, Right. make it feel different but yeah and of course you don't get a good view of this one but the next one down is is uh president barack obama on his inauguration day which i did some things with that canvas you see obviously that his hand is down there but you don't see the bible it's on and the presidential seal behind him doesn't have president on it i didn't want to put any letters on there and i found later as i thought about it I liked it without having that because I think there's something to say about making a vow on something you hold precious, which is not really the the uh, the Bible is not the precious thing you you're really holding your hand on. You're holding it on something beyond the Bible. Mm -hmm. The Bible is just a symbol of of what's really happening. Okay and. So that was cool. And the president, the words president didn't mean a lot to me either because he's an individual. The first black president goes beyond being a president. He's a leader. He's, he's a lot of things we could describe him as, but he's beyond what we want to say. Oh, he was the first black president. He wasn't just the first black president to me. So I, I, I kind of left some symbols out to show that Barack the man is a guy I'd love to shake hands with and have a conversation with and maybe even shoot a little basketball with him because I'm old. I can't really shoot around that much, but I would shoot with him. And I, you know, I would definitely enjoy that. So that was, and then past that, there's a, there's a portrait past him that you can't see at this angle. I, I, I included this shot because it was showing some well hung, some well hung art. Not that the art was that great, but but the hanging was good. And that's a portrait of me down there at the end when I was 17 years old, going to Columbus College of Art and Design. I did a, I did a drawing of myself standing in the bathroom, looking in the mirror. And huh. I took that drawing to class, and we had to do self-portraits in that class. And I did a portrait and knocked it out within, like, literally 45 minutes. I had my face done. And I realized that, I don't know, I'm pretty proficient at this. I could do this. That's my freshman year. That's before they really taught me much. Okay. The thing I learned in college was that I don't know nearly enough, but um, I mean, there's so much more to learn. It's, that's the real statement. Wow. All these books, all these teachers, all these things and tools are out there, mm. but there was so much more to learn. Mm. And I feel like that even today. But going into college, I really felt that. <laughs> going from high school to college is like, wow, just a lot. So that, that photograph just kind of represented me having some, having some things in the exhibit. And um, mm. they aren't really good angles of the art, but I wanted to still include it because I thought it was just it was a good exhibit, and well, to be honest, I think Frederick Frederick Douglass is looking at you, saying, "Good job, man." I love the expression on his face. It's just well, you might have said that. The, the thing that you know, you mentioned that, Ellen, but I a detail comes to mind. This church was probably ninety eight percent white. Uh, it had all these representations of black individuals on here, and I thought. Uh -huh. I went and hung out after the service at the church and answered questions, and it it was beautiful. It was just like they had questions that were pertinent and mm. and good, and I just I felt good about the whole experience. Wonderful. Wonderful. Are you exhibiting anywhere right now? Can is there anywhere people can go and see your work like currently in Columbus? Well, in Columbus, there's in Ohio. The Bella's Restaurant on Miller and Oak. Oh. They're a nice place to eat, and they have 
three of my paintings in the wall. And uh, there's, if you want to go to a neat place to go just to get out, the, used to be the clock restaurant many years ago. It's called Elevator Brewing Company now. It's on High Street. The Elevator Brewing Company has one of my paintings. It's like seven foot by, I think, five foot. And it's just people toasting beer at the elevator. Got, they even got their logo in the painting. I was proud of that painting. It was the largest thing I'd ever done um, besides walk, doing on the walls, the largest cams ever painted on. And that's still there. He's, he owns that. Um, that's two things in Columbus. Um, and then you'd have to go to Central State University over in Wilberforce. It's, it's actually called the National African American Museum and, and Cultural Center. Oh yes, I know. And, uh, they've they've got three pieces on display until February of mine. It's a beautiful show, though. I, I, I'm going to go back again because they have um, history, you know, black history. They got they've got comic book history, black comic book characters. It's just an awesome place that I didn't even know about until Tom Malou told me about it. <laughs> so he he encouraged me to uh to you know to enter and I did and got accepted. He's got a couple pieces there himself, so it was nice experience. I've had a good year so far. Well, Eric, before we come to closure, I'm going to mention conversations and coffee in the next two weeks, and uh, then let's uh, think of how we're going to come to say thank you. We are so grateful to you. Eric Scott Murphy. Let me say that in two weeks, November 11th, in the Loft Gallery artists, Barbara Vogel and Marge Bender will join us to discuss masks. You probably see that right here in the gallery. It's an exhibit centered around familiar surgical masks and all the playful ways that both artists explore them. So join us in two weeks, November 11th, by Zoom at noon, uh, as you are right there next to those playful masks there, Eric. <laughs> I'm going to talk to Bob about those masks. I, I thought those were great. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's been so wonderful being with you. And um, coming to know how you have, from the time you were in well, let's say third grade was a little late. It was even earlier than that. Yeah, so become an artist. Kindergarten, about fifth grade. John, maybe you learn to draw. Oh, wonderful. Well, your works are magnificent. And they call us to beauty, but they call us to thinking in a very important way. And we thank you, Eric Scott Murphy. Thank you. And don't forget, Lindsay. Ah, mm -hmm. oh, for sure. <laughs> of course, of course. Thank you. All right, thank you.